Yeah, so my name's Tim. I'm a, um, a project manager um, in the data and technology team at the Melbourne Genomics Health Alliance. Uh, yes, Australian, um, and I apologise if it's hard to follow the accent. Um, you know, just bear with us and hopefully uh, we won't need the interpreter or anything like that. So, um, we're really appreciative of being able to come and speak here today and Dean and Nexus ask us to come and speak. Uh, I think we've got a, uh, a good story to tell, something uh, interesting and maybe a little bit different. Uh, so why do we think this topic's uh, interesting? Uh, first of all, we're a program um, that's a clinical implementation program. So we're all about integrating genomics into the clinical setting uh, to improve healthcare outcomes. Second is because of the uh, configuration of Alliance, we have a number of members, we are um, building shared system and a shared system that uh, enables uh, multiple testing laboratories to provision uh, testing workflows uh, from the FASTQ to the, um, to the clinical report. Thirdly, uh, because of uh, the fact that we're building this shared system, um, the way that we uh, deploy DNA Nexus uh, it has some novelty value to it, so we'll hopefully find that interesting. And of course, uh, we don't just want to talk about the technology, we also want to talk about how we've worked with DNA Nexus to achieve the outcomes. So what we're going to talk about is four parts. Um, I'm going to talk about the alliance, the vision, the objectives and the uh, program of work. And then we're going to introduce Genovic, which is our shared clinical system for genomics. And uh, because I'm not a hardcore techie, I'm going to ask Anthony Marty here, our technical manager, who's going to do that part of the talk. And then we're going to talk about establishing uh, DNA Nexus as part of uh, Genovic. And to do that, um, Chris Yang, who's a clinical bioinformatician and served as the analysis owner through the implementation project. And then I'm going to uh, grace the stage finally to talk about working with DNA Nexus. So the Alliance. So the Melbourne Genomics Health Alliance is a uh, collaboration of 10 health-based organisations based in Melbourne, Victoria, uh, five hospitals, five research institutes. Uh, it was formed in 2013. It was really uh, where the, um, the uh, heads of those member organisations wanted to, uh, to sort of bring their collective expertise together and impact somewhere in health um, or impact on an area in health which they thought would be significant in the future. And they decided that genomics and the integration of genomics into the healthcare system as being that thing to collaborate on. So uh, an initial phase of work uh, was established, essentially uh, to assess the value of genomic testing for five different disease areas. And from that work, the evidence gathered from that work, a, um, the Victorian state government uh, committed $25 million for a four-year funded uh, program of work. We are in the third of that four years and uh, it's due to finish at the end of 2019. Um, and since we've started, so through that initial phase and also through the, um, the program, we've uh, tested over 2,000 patients in 17 different disease areas. So why genomics? So the short answer is that, um, uh, you know, sort of the healthcare that incorporates genomics can change people's lives, or a healthcare system that incorporates genomics can change lives. Um, it can change lives through the, um, uh, the diagnosis of rare disease. It can change lives through the uh, informing on treatment options for cancer. Uh, and it can um, inform on uh, risk and the prediction of uh, the disease in the future. So uh, we've seen over the five years that we've been operating already about the value of offering genomic testing into our uh, hospitals. And just if you have a look, there's a couple of quotes here as well. We've got some from sort of the clinical perspective and one from the patient perspective that really sort of affirms the, um, the value of um, integrating genomics into healthcare. So one of the uh, guiding principles of the, our work is uh, around the whole system change. So it's not just about provisioning testing to patients. It's, a, it, it's, it's more than that, it's about sort of that, that holistic uh, you know, system of change within the healthcare setting. So when we're developing, uh, so when we're designing and building our information systems to support our work, um, we've got that in mind. So the requirements sort of just transcend just provisioning the test. There's also a whole lot of other things to consider, sort of right from, you know, sort of uh, the order of the test all the way to the returning of the, the report and how that information is used to inform on the patient's care. Okay, so um, uh, another sort of uh, concept I said before, we're a clinical implementation program. So the way that we like, sort of like to uh, sort of articulate that, um, 
that, that clinical focus is through this nice little analogy. So on the left here, we have uh, research. So research is like the fighter jet. You know, it's, uh, it's got a specific purpose, it's agile, and it can change direction very quickly. Where on the other end, clinical care is the commuter jet. Now the commuter jet has to be robust, needs to be reliable, and it needs to be able to safely transport millions of passengers a year with a, with a, a consistent level of service. So uh, again, when we're, we're thinking about uh, the systems that we put in place to support our work, we sort of uh, we think about the, um, the concepts there of the commuter jet to support that. Another sort of a guiding principle of the work we do is around um, is, is sort of like uh, is to um, sorry is uh, that we uh, start small and uh, we test early. So we've done a lot of work in prototyping systems, in particular around the analysis and curation. And that informed on the uh, requirements and the design of our future state systems. And a lot of that work was done through our clinical flagships, um, our disease flagships, and um, we are using that sort of learning to then to build the future state systems that we can be uh, implemented and then continually improved on in the future. So here's a little bit about our program of work. So using you know, those guiding principles around the clinical focus and the whole of system change and the uh, uh, and the like that uh, we've sort of formulated this program of work. I'm not going to go into it in, uh, too, uh, too detail, but I will put an emphasis on uh, Stream 4, which is uh, the access to uh, genomic information stream, and that's where we exist. And I was going to read it, but it's actually I can probably... No, I can't see. So uh, the uh, objective of that stream is to develop and implement a single set of standards, policies and procedures to support common infrastructure for the management and use of genomic data by... I can't read that... Uh, by stakeholders in Victoria. So that's really the objective of the work we're doing in, in the information management, information systems, data and technology world. And to realise that or to... Uh, um, uh, that objective, um, we are going to deliver a system uh, called Genovic. So Genovic is our shared clinical system for genomics and really initially it has two purposes. So Genovic will support the use of genomic testing, uh, better enabling accredited laboratories with a robust common platform to perform analysis and variant curation. And secondary, uh, secondary uh, Genovic will provide the foundations to facilitate controlled access to genomic data to support secondary use such as research activities. So there's our focus in the, uh, the remainder of the program from a delivery perspective. So we've, uh, we've started the delivery phase, but just to even get to that point, there was a whole lot of work that needed to be done. So first of all, um, we needed our members to foster collaboration in our members, um, all 10 of them, and uh, so they could build trust to even consider um, de um, developing and uh, delivering a system like Genovic. We did, as I said before, we did a whole lot of work around uh, prototyping and to understand our requirements. Um, and that really informed on the, uh, the design of Genovic, uh, which we're now putting in place. And because we are funded by the Victorian State Government, there was a need uh, to go through a very comprehensive, uh, very comprehensive procurement process. And I know there'll be some people from DNA Nexus who are part of that and do remember that. Um, and, um, but, and that was all in aid to be able to, uh, to identify and select the, uh, the, the commercial tools that we wanted to put as part of the Genovic system. And once we went through that, obviously, we had to engage with the vendors, DNA Nexus and Agile and our other, our other software vendor, and set up the implementation for delivery. So just to get to this point, we we're very proud of the achievements, that, that, that all the work that had been done just to get here. So I'm going to hand it over to Anthony, who's going to speak about Genovic in a bit more detail. Thank you, Tim. So Genovic is a suite of services that are orchestrated into clinical workflows and integrated with our laboratory's LIM systems. So the heart of Genovic is our genomic orchestration service, we call GOS, and it's an in-house application that we built using serverless technology on Amazon. And our services that we offer in Genovic, uh, DNA Nexus for our secondary analysis, Agile and Salissa Interpret for our variant curation, and AWS itself we use for compute and storage. Our labs integrate with Genovic through GOS using a single API endpoint. Uh, this enables our labs to uh, not have to worry about all of the discrete APIs of all the services. It gives a consistent interaction and entry point to our orchestration. 
So from a lab's point of view, they interact with Genevic using the fire APIs that we've put together. So the lab will put together a fire order and send that into Genevic. And the whole orchestration starts from FastQ files and ends in a clinical report. So Genevic will orchestrate the clinical workflows to produce the report. Uh, the report can go back to the requesting lab as either a uh, diagnostic report in fire or as a PDF if the labs uh, would prefer that. So I'll just talk about the workflow uh, going through Genevic, and I'll start with a blood sample, and that goes to the lab. It accompanies uh, a request for an analysis, and so the lab does its preparation, uh, extraction, a library prep, and sends it to a sequencing machine. And the sequencing machine will produce the genomic data uh, in the FastQ format, which is then uploaded to a lab-specific S3 bucket, or it can go straight to DNA Nexus. We give our labs lots of options of how they get their data up into the cloud. It's at this point that the lab has everything that they need. They've done their internal QC. They know exactly what they need to do. They place an order into Genevic through the GOS API. And that order contains information about the location of the files, what type of workflow to run on DNA Nexus, phenotypes about the patient, anything that they need to uh, to use during the workflows. If there's any issues with the order, our orchestration service will tell the lab immediately and it can be amended. But if everything looks good, then GOS will start to translate the fire order into discrete API calls. And it will start to interact with DNA Nexus. So we're doing things like creating projects, uh, making uh, workflows available, setting up permissions, and also making sure the data makes its way into that environment. So once that's all ready, we run our workflows, which result in your VCFs, BAMs. And then we transition all that data into what we're calling our long-term storage. So that's all of the artifacts, right from the fast queues all the way through to the VCFs uh, and anything in between. And that's where we store uh, according to the storage policies that the labs will implement. At this point, the orchestration service will also retrieve the VCF file from DNA Nexus and interact with Agilent. So it'll create patient in there if required, upload the variants, start an analysis in there if required. All of this up until this point is automatic, and it's at this point that the lab will be informed that there's some data that needs to be curated, or a curator will log in as part of their routine and see that there's some new information there that they can begin to work on. The curation process starts. For our labs, it's all complex cases, so there's no automatic variant curation. This is all hands-on. Once the curation is completed, the case is marked as, as done and signed off, and the orchestration service will retrieve from uh, our, our curation system the data from that uh, curation. So that's the interpretation of the variants, the pathogenicities, and the evidence that was used. That data is then translated and mapped back to the fire spec, and that comes back to the requesting lab as a diagnostic report, or they can also retrieve a PDF from Agilent if required. The lab then uh, puts its stamp on the report and sends it back to the requesting doctor. So that is uh, all happening up in the cloud. Uh, you can see the bottom part is where the lab owns the process and everything up there. So because we're on Amazon and we're using uh, serverless architecture, everything scales automatically. We don't have any issues with volumes. Uh, and we found that using things like uh, the step functions and lambdas work really effectively for our needs. So I'd just like to hand it over to Chris now, who's going to talk about establishing DNA Nexus as part of Genevic. Thank you, Anthony. Hope you guys can hear me. G'day, everyone. My name is Chris. So firstly, I'd just like to say that I'm really nervous. <laughs> um, a little jet lag, which is not a good combination. Um, but I also let, 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 want to let you guys know this is going to be more geared towards uh, software design and not bioinformatics. But I'm sure we all know what a GATK workflow looks like. All right, so as mentioned by Tim, uh, the Alliance consists of a diverse range of genomic labs. And one of the goals in the Alliance, aside from giving them the ability to do clinical testing, is to get these labs to collaborate. Now, we all know that collaboration can be really challenging, and so we weren't trying to build a system that would solve all of these challenges, but we did want to build a system that would at least um, solve some of the technical ones. The reality is that in the Alliance, different labs have different technical capabilities. 
Some labs have more advanced infrastructure, like this lab, which has a HPC cluster. Some labs have existing bioinformatic resources and pipelines. Other labs might have both, and they form part of a clinical accredited system, whereas others don't have either yet. So where does DNA Nexus fit into the picture? Well, it forms part of this technical solution for Genevic and provides the ability um, to uplift the infrastructure capabilities of the labs, now giving them access to the cloud, but also a platform on which we set out to build a set of shared bioinformatic pipelines, starting with a shared germline pipeline and a shared somatic pipeline. And these pipelines are available to, to the labs for their clinical tests and research, but also um, they are there so that the labs can collaborate together. So now that we chose DNA Nexus to build these shared pipelines, we had to assess some of its technical capabilities in doing this task. Now, some of the useful capabilities we found was its graphical user interface, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, it has layers of ex existing infrastructure being built on top of the cloud. It has user and organization administration, which is important for us with an alliance with many organizations. Um, there's technical support, there's data governance, and a diverse API for us to interact with in a variety of different programming languages. But we wanted to build a system that would reach the technical diversity of the labs, and so there were some additional requirements that we needed to consider in the design. We needed to employ some rigorous software engineering, so for example, like version control. Now, DNA Nexus provide us with a version of version control, but we really wanted to have a standard like Git um, in order to enable us to have things like code collaboration between the labs, reproducibility, and to open the door to things like continuous integration and test-driven development. We needed portability, um, such that the shared pipeline components could run on and off DNA Nexus. And this could, um, this, this could enable um, integration into an existing clinical system, but also so that we could reach some of the users who cannot use DNA Nexus for whatever reason. Okay. So with this in mind, we tried different design options, starting with the most simplest. Now, bear in mind, this was um, a year ago in 2017, and things have changed since. Um, with FanFan's talk, with all the developments, that's really exciting stuff. But what we initially tried was first the native implementation approach. By this I mean we just simply used the graphical user interface to build the shared pipelines with existing DNA Nexus apps. And this is a quick and great and e easy way that's user friendly to build pipelines. Immediately what we found was one of the issues might be, sorry. Oh, it's that test thing, sorry. <laughs> Oh, everyone's getting it, okay. All right, we're all good. <laughs> I think the president's all right. Um, all right, so what we found with this method was immediately was there would be a sort of issue for us to integrate it with a version control system like Git. To do so, we would probably have to download the workflow as a JSON object, and this is what we would be um, version controlling, which was not ideal for us. Um, we also wanted to write our pipelines with code um, so that we could have a standard way to build the pipelines as well as to afford more complex tasks like integrating it with the, with the orchestration system which Anthony mentioned. And it offered no portability for us to run outside of DNA Nexus. All right, so the next thing we tried was using a workflow language. In this case, we chose Whittle to do so. Um, and this seemed like a really awesome um, solution. DNA Nexus supported with DX Whittle. Um, it allows us to achieve uh, portability as any system that can run a Whittle workflow can run the pipeline. Um, and also it worked really well, well with version control compared to the previous method which, had, which used JSON. Um. All right, so there was one hindrance to this which was that when we were experimenting with it at the time, which was a year ago, uh, DX Whittle was very experimental itself. We also weren't guaranteed of its support. Um, it seems like that's changed. Um, and there was some reduced cap capabilities at the time for things like nested workflows, conditionals, maps, and objects. But this is, might have changed since, and it's something that we're still looking forward to, whether it be a workflow language in CWL or, or Whittle. All right, so our chosen design. So what we decided to do was use the combination of the Python API, um, DXPy, um, to build the shared pipeline but also using Docker containers as the components of the pipeline. So most of you might know what Docker is. It's a technology that allows you to bundle an application and its dependencies uh, together into what's known as a Docker container. And this allows you to run 
the application on a variety of different systems. And this includes TNA Nexus, which has support with this tool called DX Docker. Um, so the way we designed the pipeline was we tried to separate the majority of the pipeline complexity from any DNA Nexus uh, specific code. This allowed us to um, make the DNA Nexus specific code just act as a thin wrapper around the Docker component to build the app or applet. And then once we had our components, all our applets, we then strung them together with the Python API building the pipeline and publishing it onto DNA Nexus. So with this, you get a couple things. You get interoperable components, bioinformatic components that can run on a variety of different systems. They can easily be plugged into an external system if we wish, or external pipeline, and can easily transition into the workflow language. Um, we made sure that when we built these pipelines, we made sure they translated well onto, gra onto the graphical user interface, such that they were still customizable, um, such that you know, they were still understandable, not like some workflow that had a single app that ran like a very complex workflow, for example. And also, it worked really well with version control, which allowed us to establish this collaboration between the labs, um, and also so that we can open the door to things like continuous integration, test-driven development. Now, the con here is, in reality, Docker is a system that has its issues, um, and it, it is a requirement for this, so I just wanted to list that there. So this is how we integrated DNA Nexus in Genovic, um, and now I'd like to pass to Tim, who's going to talk about working with DNA Nexus. Thanks, Chris. Um, I notice that we're, we're sort of running out of time, but given the fact we've come 15 hours here and we've copped a Trump alert in the middle of our uh, thing, uh, hopefully you can give us a few more, few more minutes. So working with DNA Nexus, so um, as sort of from the discussion from these guys has really brought out, there's a lot of challenges and complexity to what we're doing to even you know, be able to establish not just DNA Nexus, but also all the uh, services into uh, Genevix. So um, it's really important that we had a, a really good partner to work with to do this. And uh, what we discovered really early on, uh, we were working with the scientific team, that though it was really a collaborative mindset. So they really wanted to work with our team um, to meet our goals, which is great. Um, they were motivated to get the best outcome. So, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, complex uh, problems that we had to solve, and they really wanted to put the effort in with us to get the uh, solution to those problems. Uh, obviously, expertise and knowledge. Uh, our teams, uh, you know, had weaknesses. Uh, we didn't know everything, um, and it was great to have uh, to be able to leverage off the uh, the expertise within DNA Nexus to supplement the places where we did have a bit of weakness. And most importantly, um, as a lot of you are aware, in the environments that you work, uh, genomics is rapidly evolving, changes very quickly, and uh, in our alliance it changes very quickly. So it's really great to work with someone who acknowledged that and is prepared to be uh, um, a sort of adaptable and uh, comfortable uh, within the changing environment that we are and basically come on the journey with us. So um, it has been a really good partnership um, in doing this work. So we've got some, uh, just a, I've got a, uh, uh, some pictures and uh, names of all our country, um, key, sorry, contributors that have worked with us over the uh, last 12 to 18 months. Um, special thanks to Brett Hannigan, who's probably been our key collaborator on that. You've been fantastic, Brett. We really enjoy working with you on this uh, project. And uh, again, thanking DNA Nexus for their work and working with us. And uh, hopefully we continue that as we uh, improve um, Genevic. Uh, to uh, sort of um, improve healthcare within Victoria. So that's it, thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Thank you.